Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Institute for Policy Studies. It's great to see some people here in person and many more of you online will be joining us tonight for an extraordinary uh, event. We've been hearing for recent days a great deal about the 20th anniversary of the US invasion of Iraq and the occupation that follows and is continuing. And we've been hearing a number of different aspects of it, whether it was a mistake or whether it was, as many of us believe, a massive crime against humanity. And what we're not hearing as much about is Iraq today. So that is what we're here to talk about tonight. I just want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for recognizing the importance of continuing our work against the continuing occupation in Iraq. And we're going to have two extraordinary speakers tonight on conditions going on in Iraq today. I'm going to introduce you now to my colleague and partner at IPS, Karee Peterson-Smith, who is the Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow here. My name is Phyllis Bennis. I'm the director of the New Internationalism Project here at IPS. I want to thank Netfa Freeman, our events guy, for putting together the technology for getting this all together. Uh, it's always a collective endeavor, but Netfa took the lead. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Um, Karee will introduce our speakers, and we look forward to your questions and comments after the presentations tonight. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Karee Peterson-Smith. Um, as Phyllis mentioned, I'm the Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow here at the Institute for Policy Studies. And before introducing our incredible speakers tonight, um, I want to uh, also um, acknowledge that we are not only live streaming on the IPS Facebook, but we are streaming um, on Instagram Live on the Dissenters um, Instagram account. Dissenters is an amazing, um, youth anti-militarism uh, organization. So shout out to the centers. And if you are a young person who wants to organize against militarism, um, find them on Instagram or um, on social media at We Are the Centers and go to wearethecenters.org. So thank you to them. And uh, thank you to our speakers who I'll now introduce. Um, you know, we're reflecting on 20 years since the US invasion, uh, the 2003 US invasion of Iraq. And there was uh, a point 20 years ago when um, Iraq and the US invasion and the subsequent occupation were very much in the news. And there was a point at which, frankly, the conversation around Iraq simply dropped off in the United States um, for a number of reasons. The mainstream media, US officials, and others lost interest in what's, what's happening in Iraq. Uh, but while the conversation here in the US stopped, Life in Iraq, of course, continued. Iraqis continue to survive and to shape their own futures and their lives. We have um, an incredible couple of people here to discuss those recent histories as well as contemporary realities for Iraqis. So Nabil Saleh is a Baghdadi poet, a bilingual journalist and photographer, currently completing a master's in Arab studies at Georgetown University. His writings, including his Baghdad Walk series, appear in Al Jazeera English, Jadalia, Middle East Eye, and other illustrious publications, and are translated into Spanish, French, and Italian. His solo photography exhibition, A Requiem for Baghdad, Postcards from a Crime Scene, is currently on display at Georgetown University's Loinger Library. Loinger, thank you. Um, and then Kali Rubai, is an assistant professor of anthropology at Purdue University. Her research explores the environmental impacts of less than lethal militarism and how military projects rearrange political ecologies in the name of letting live. Her book project, Counter Resurgency, examines how farmers in Anbar, Iraq, struggle to survive and recover from transnational counterinsurgency projects. Really grateful to have both of you. Um, and if you want to uh, open uh, with some words, uh, Nabil. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. Uh, uh, you know, it's, 
It's funny, us who are left behind are usually spoken about for and after in, this, in the global north, even by people who are concerned about the Middle East. So not often do we get the opportunity to speak. Um, so I want to say a few words, and, and I, I often write about my personal uh, lived experience, but not because I victimize it myself, but rather to, to show how my experience, just a shard of what uh, humans uh, have endured and continue to endure in this uh, forgotten theater of operations, or now field of study. Mm -hmm. So Sargon Bolas, the late Iraqi poet, uh, once wrote, the refugees are on the road, the women are wailing in the squares, the children are in coffins, your family is fine, they send their best from the cemeteries. Mm -hmm. Baghdad is a spike of grain to which grasshoppers cling. I come to you from there, it is annihilation. So what happened? 1991, Iraq was bombed back to the pre-industrial age, as James Baker would say. It was the first war where depleted uranium, a nuclear waste byproduct was used uh, against Iraq and continues to live. This is what Kali going to speak about. And, and the soil and, and women uh, and the wombs of, of our women. And uh, of course, incinerating in the process, hundreds of civilians in, in forgotten crimes, such as the Amriya bomb shelter, where hundreds, including my father's aunt uh, and her children, uh, would, would, would perish. And, and all of them buried in not only in the soil of Iraq, but in the cellar of limbo as well. And then 1998 would come, Operation Desert Fox, and that's where uh, I first encountered war. Uh, as the uh, skies of Iraq would lit up in flames and of course civilians would pay a heavy price and we were under sanctions and uh, while so many did not even taste a banana or a red apple because all of these were luxuries now, countless of civilians, incalculable thousands of civilians and children would perish in cancers because not only malnutrition but the lack of medication would, would, be, would be lethal and then war would limp its way again to the gates of Iraq and uh, among the many things that happened, as Human Rights Watch documented at the time, uh, uh, two million submunitions, cluster submunitions, were rained uh, over Iraq. Three, three of these duds were lurking in my family's garden. And had my father not warned me about it, I would have been uh, probably not sitting here with you. And uh, what happens afterwards is what Idala Calvino calls the inferno of the living. We are confined to the to the indoors and outside, only silence between intermittent lethal clashes with the American forces. And then Al Qaeda would later hi hijack the resistance, uh, along with Jason Mahdi, of course, and, and these Shia militias. And then uh, corpses and stray dogs, of course. And these uh, stray dogs continue to bark in our heads at night, in our poems, in our writings, and the corpses that were hanged from nearby bridges would continue to sway in our heads for a long, long time. And uh, among the many things that happened, we were displaced from our home by a Sunni armed group. And, and they are, this is the arbitrariness of the occupation. My father would be kidnapped by a Shia armed group. And his brother, my uncle, would be kidnapped by a Sunni armed group. So where is civil war here? The, the line between, between sects, between... And, uh, and again, uh, I would grow up and, and choose to become a, a journalist over, uh, over engineering that I studied for my bachelor's. And then I would meet people like Ferdos, for example, a child who survived the bombing of, uh, and the war against ISIS, which is a, a direct consequence of the invasion. Uh, just a baby who, uh, in, in, uh, in, a in an IDP camp, uh, flipped a kettle over, over a kerosene heater in a tent where they lived and burned herself. And for those couldn't sleep uh, and couldn't, uh, excuse me, couldn't speak. And uh, so many people who continue to, to live with the nightmares inside, inside their heads. And, uh, and then the protest would happen. And, and this will, uh, I will uh, speak, elaborate more about it afterwards. But this is what happens. And the point here is that war it's not a single explosion, as I recently wrote, that happened in a distant then, but it continues to live with us. It has afterlives. And uh, leave it to Callie. 
And I hate when you stop talking though. Um, I would like to show some images and my talk is a lot less poetic and much more scientific. Um, basically what I wanna do is pick up on where Nabil left off that there are, are some testimonies you can find about the last 20 years, but really what we're here to do is prepare for the next 20, because this is for so many of the children that I work with, um, the war on terror starts today. They have no memory of this past and they're growing up among the ghosts that Nabil is mentioning. Um, so what I wanna show here is, uh, I'm going to highlight a few examples of the environmental health harms that continue to affect Iraq's environment now. And I, I wanna make the case here that Iraq's environmental degradation from war is exemplary, but it's not exceptional. And that if we exceptionalize the US-Iraq relationship, we're gonna do a lot of damage to the transnational potential. Um, so what I mean by this is that um, if we look at the toxic legacy of US empire in Iraq, then we can see all of the people and places that are implicated in the war on terror as this, uh, as a structure rather than an event with an aftermath. Um, so basically what I've been doing is following the toxic chain of supply. So we, we see all of these metals and depleted uranium being one of them dumped in Iraq over the last 20 years in two major epochs. And then the question is where do they come from and where do they go? And what does that say about the toxic relationships that we're all living in? So um, I'll just briefly start with a couple of facts. Iraq is warming five times faster than the rest of the planet. Mass fish death, mass hospitalization, high rates of cancer in the South, a 17 fold increase in birth defects in Fallujah and a 50% deforestation of the country's landscape mean that Iraq is facing environmental and public health catastrophes that were triggered and amplified by the US invasion. And it produced this cascade but part of that cascade were the hundred orders that the US implemented 20 years ago that have become Iraq's privatization policies. Um, so from a toxicity perspective, because this was a war for profit, the sheer tonnage of toxic materials that entered Iraq's landscape were um, multiple, right? So instead of a regular war, which is already bad, the US was burning things like tank sightings and flat screen TVs that made it comfortable to be in forward operating bases. And so we just basically ignited the kinds of electronics equipment that nobody wants to be breathing. But the other thing is that the corporations that were doing that and profit from that, that wasteful consumptive process are the ones that many people's retirements are invested in. So our complicity is so incredibly diffuse. A lot of Americans have talked about burn pits lately. So I'm gonna start there because to me, that's a forensic location. Um, jet fuel was doused on everything from uniforms to human waste to all of the extra toxic stuff. Um, and then burned sometimes in tiny little barrels as, as uh, Curry's research has been showing. And then sometimes these large scale incinerary fields. And now of course, a lot of veterans who were only exposed for a short period of time at the prime of their lives, are now facing cancer and respiratory illness and death. And meanwhile, whole Iraqi communities have been living for 10 years downwind of these burn pits um, and they were exposed from cradle to grave. So today though, um, burn pits look a lot like this. Uh, no, you're good. Um, this is uh, the scar essentially of a burn pit. This is someone's farmland and uh, it's farmland that is basically become unusable because in spite of the burn pit that was there or near there having been closed now for almost a decade, nothing grows there. And all of the animals that are living on this land continue to get sick. They develop cancers. They have um, children, the cows and, and sheep have children with birth defects that don't survive. And so the farmers are, are in trouble. Um, and, and the woman who lives on this land, she was a newlywed an 18 year old newlywed when the US invaded. And now she's in her 40s. And over the course of her life, she's had multiple miscarriages, several stillbirths and given birth to children who've only lived for a few days or weeks. And she attributes that to the presence of the US military in general, a symbol of which is the burn pit. Now they're in their 40s, this couple, and they're having to change their farming practices, partly because they don't have enough children to sustain the landscape that they would have were they to have a normal healthy reproductive life, but they also feel like they have to grow different 
plants and raise different animals because the contamination legacy is only now beginning on the landscape. And uh, this farmer, Abu Khaled, is his uh, pseudonym. He said, no one will ever buy this land. So we're stuck here and we want to leave. This is what displacement looks like in Iraq for people who've returned to toxified land. So when we talk about burn pits, though, what makes that military grade toxicity that people fear so much happens a lot earlier on the chain of supply. So in asking where these materials come from, we can do the next slide. I visited uh, the DRC and this is a mine in Kulwezi. This by the way, is a national park and a nature preserve that has been equally devastated. Its landscape has been devastated differently by the economy of war. So this is where minerals are mined, whether that's coltan for the computer that, um, that operates the drones or um, uranium that is siding, uh, lining the tank sidings or lining um, missiles. And essentially what's going on here is that the miners are also facing the same health problems that people in Iraq are facing, but they're also dying of mine shaft collapse and um, premature injury because this is a completely deregulated industry. It's part of the corporate private industry that distributes these materials all over the world. And because these are artisanal miners, they're selling things to a middleman and selling those to another middleman. And so by the time a company like Raytheon purchases these materials, it's almost impossible to trace, but not entirely impossible. And this is one of those um, toxic supply chain locations that might be a place for disruption. So we can add the bodies of people in Africa to the body count in the, in the US invasion of Iraq. Um, in this way, burn pits are like a receipt in that they give us a tally of all of the relationships and materials that got dumped onto Iraqi people. Um, the next slide is Colfax, Louisiana. Um, this is a list of just a few of the things that were burned in the burn pit there. This is a, um, the site of the Colfax massacre, which some of you may know from American history. There's actually a monument in Colfax, Louisiana still that's honoring and commemorating the white killers in the Colfax massacre as dying in defense of white supremacy. Um, this is a place that's now facing environmental racism because undetonated munitions from Camp Menon and other military installments in the US are getting blown up here. And this community now has to listen to the sound of war, sometimes so loud that it shakes their houses off their foundations. Another community that is wrapped up in the web of war on terror. Okay, so of the materials from one end of the supply chain to the other, um, I also wanna show the long haul effects on the landscape. So we can look at the next slide. Uh, this is Fallujah three weeks ago. I, I just got back. And Fallujah has a brand new shopping mall, um, brand new paved road in the center of town. In Iraq, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. And that's partly because the US installed policies that we now call corruption when we blame Iraqis, but was actually just called privatization when the US started occupying and handed over power um, in 2005 under conditions that every sector of Iraq's society would be privatized. So what that means is there's nothing left in the public sector for repairing the landscape, providing electricity. So people living in this neighborhood have to burn diesel to have their own electricity source if they can afford a generator. They have to use personal air purifiers in their homes because the air quality is so poor. And they also have to use personal water filters because there's no public water utility all, all of that was destroyed in the US invasion and it was never restored because there was an incentive not to. So what happens to this car carcass? Um, and you'll see there are actually two car carcasses. One looks like a car that was damaged or abandoned and the one behind it looks like it was blown up. Basically, um, the poor in Iraq are doing the dirty work of cleaning up from post-war damage. So the next slide. Um, what happens is that um, families who work in construction um, or collect scrap metal are often the first to return after a battle period, and they're doing all the cleaning up, demolishing, and rebuilding. And um, right now in Iraq, you can make about $60, $60 per ton of scrap metal if you want to, sh to gather it and ship it up north. So right now, scrap metal that's been left since the 90s is being aggregated and shipped up north to Iraqi Kurdistan. And... Um, Basically, what we're seeing is it's arriving in places like Bazian Valley. This is the last chunk, I promise. 
Um, we can do the next slide. This is Bazian Valley. Um, you can see the air quality is very poor. The animals are quite upset because there's a significant 24 seven air um, noise pollution. And that's actually people's chief complaint. This is a valley that sits on Iraq's largest underwater aquifer, freshwater aquifer, and it's growing a lot of food, but it's also where the cement and concrete industry is booming in Iraq. And this is because there was so much destruction that the post-war reconstruction industry is corrupt and, and operating very rapidly. In this valley, uh, there is a steel manufacturing plant that builds rebar, and it's cheap, low-quality rebar that's basically setting um, cities up for the next Istanbul. Um, you can go to the next slide. So what's happening is scrap metal, you can see missile shells on the side, are being collected, and they're going and being compiled here. And then in this factory, it's Indian, and sometimes in the concrete factories, Chinese um, rural communities are being shipped in to do this labor. Local Iraqis are, and local Kurds are not, um, in, in Iraqi Kurdistan, are not being prioritized as employees because they have too much power, too much organizing power, and they're too expensive. That's part of the privatization policies that the US implemented. Employing local labor is not required. And so we can now add Indian, Chinese, um, Congolese, and American bodies to this count in, in what the Iraq war has brought. The problem here is that this looks a lot like a um, swords into plowshares, green recycling option, except this is the worst thing you could do with heavy metals. Remetabolizing these into the environment is actually making more people, another generation of Iraqis are inhaling the past detritus of war because it's getting broken down and burned and turned into fumes. And there's a preference here for heavy metals because they're stronger and denser, which means the more toxic materials are getting metabolized faster. You can see in the middle photo, there are holes shooting through the ceiling. That's light streaming through the ceiling of this factory. That's because some of the munitions that are processed weren't exploded yet. And then they got detonated by being heated up. It's very dangerous work and it continues to reverberate across the valley. So basically what I'm trying to show, having taken you very quickly from burn pit to mine to uh, whatever this is, um, is that the, the the US invasion is by no means over. If anything, it's just gotten started. And if we follow the chemical legacy of just one set of chemicals, which is metal, we can basically look at this transnational web of toxic relationships that has only ever been more entrenched over the last 20 years. And I think that's epitomized by Biden just recently giving more resources than were even requested um, to the US military, which essentially um, offers us an opportunity now to be thinking strategically about where to be abolishing these relationships, whether that's through boycott and divestment or sabotage or, or protest. Um, this is the supply chain that needs to be attacked. I'll stop there. Okay, well, thank you both. Um, let's take a deep breath. I know that was a lot. And actually, truthfully, you know, I feel like between the two of your presentations in these past few minutes, we've gotten more um, more of an update and more of a, a set of knowledge about life in Iraq than in the past, I don't know, 15 years in the United States. Um, so gratitude for that. Closer and forward. Okay. So with that, I actually want to, I actually want to, um, to go to this week, um, this week in the United States where there was, um, a kind of revisiting of this invasion. And um, the New York Times, um, a number of publications published a number of things. New York Times um, kind of main article reflecting on the invasion. Uh, the headline was, um, 20 years after US invasion, Iraq is a freer place, but not a hopeful one. Um, and the, could say a lot about that, um, <laughs> what, what freer means. Um, but you know, my sort of what I gathered from the mainstream conversation was um, this notion that perhaps the invasion was a mistake. Um, but when you scratch the surface and ask what exactly was mistaken, it seemed to be that this this notion that the U.S. was justified in the invasion, but unprepared for the occupation, that this wasn't thought through well enough or whatever. Um, so I 
want to offer you both an opportunity just to respond to this kind of mainstream um, uh, American take. Iraq is a freer uh, place, but not a hopeful one. So if it is a mistake, then this uh, implies miscalculations at the decision-making level that could be understood and perhaps forgiven. And here there is moral bankruptcy because the acts were predatory. If you look at the history of the United States interventions in the Middle East, when Abdel Karim Qasim toppled the monarchy in 58 and issued uh, uh, a decree uh, to uh, nationalize uh, the oil, the Kennedy ad administration were, were already looking uh, to back other uh, forces uh, on the ground. And who were they? The Ba'athists. And of course, the Ba'athists would be friends and allies during the war with Iran, but then they would fall out of favor uh, in the 90s. But about the coverage in itself, we, we often remember uh, Judith Miller and her uh, catastrophic reporting and, uh, or uh, the columns of Thomas Friedman and, and the warmongering and the Orientalist perspective. But we also forget that even the hotshots, good ones uh, were actually complicit. You have John Burns, the so-called Dean of uh, Foreign Correspondence in the United States. And embedded page 161, he writes this war on the invasion of 2003 could have been justified any day, uh, I'm paraphrasing, on the basis of human rights uh, alone. You have uh, the New York Times itself. Uh, I remember this, this headlines from Alyssa J. Rubin and uh, you know, let's be fair, the headlines are often picked not only not by the, as a journalist, you know, it's, it's often by, by the editors. But again, within the lines, she, she mentions how it is a freer society now, which is uh, attributing uh, whatever liberties, uh, tiny ones, uh, the society enjoys to the invasion. But as a journalist, you know, I, I risked my life writing every time I wrote in, in, in Baghdad. So, I would say this is factually incorrect. You have also, uh, but this is not, this is a, a bigger problem at the times. I mean, Jane Arraf, another uh, hotshot correspondent uh, with the New York Times, when Ahmed Chalebi, who was a friend of Richard Pearl and these neoconservatives from the 80s, would petition Clinton in the 90s to uh, basically to change the regime in Iraq along with Cheney and Rumsfeld within the so-called uh, project for new American century. Uh, when Ahmed Chalabi died and he is known to Iraqis as either a crook or a, a, a traitor, she, elog she writes an, an, a romantic uh, elegy uh, mm -hmm. for, for Al-Chalabi. Uh, and these people spent decades reporting from Iraq. So there is an ethical question here. And also, the, uh, it's not only the New York Times, the, a former bureau chief at the Washington Post uh, from 2003 to 2004 also wrote uh, uh, an article. He said, had we gone with a, a different plan, perhaps things would have been better. So he doesn't say that the war was a crime or the war shouldn't have happened, but a better war would have been possible. But this is how it is. And uh, I just want to mention that there is also the, the domin the capitalization on the on the situation itself and the, for example Elsa J, J. Robin if you if you write what Ali Adib a former Times uh, reporter a local reporter wrote in Rasif he writes about uh, uh, a New York Times reporter coming to him when Nazik al Malaik a poet uh, one of the pioneers of modern Arab poetry passes away and she asks him do you know her she doesn't know uh, this uh, this uh, American uh, reporter, he, just, he doesn't name her, but if you look, it's it's in her name, the article. So he writes a summary about Nazik al Malaik. He even translates one of her poems. And if you go and read the poem, it's uh, the elegy or the obituary, sorry. It's under uh, Alyssa J. Robin and Ali Adib is, uh, is only in the contributor line below. So this is uh, emblematic of the, of the ransacking of the field, which is not only the corporations or, or the 
corrupt politicians, but even within the aid uh, industry or, and journalism as well. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna read a couple of lines because the American obsession with Iraqi hope is itself historical. Um, NPR, March 2006, Iraqis in the US increasingly pessimistic about peace. Three years after the start of the US-Iraq war, um, some Iraqi expats are increasingly pessimistic about the prospect for peace. Al Jazeera, 2007, Iraqis pessimistic about the future. Gallup News, 2007, economic negativity abounds. Iraqis dissatisfaction with economic conditions, the highest in the last three years. NBC News, 2007, only 18% of Iraqis have confidence in the US. Relief Web, 2008, Baghdadis are pessimistic about the future. Pessimism is on the streets. The National News, 2015, Iraqi general Public is deeply pessimistic about a military's weakness. IRI News 2020, new Iraq poll. Iraqis have been mostly negative in their outlook for the future. Ira um, October 2021, Euro News. Iraq apathetic and pessimistic as millions vote. Um, so the obsession with the degree to which there is hope or pessimism about Iraqi attitudes has seemed to be the gauge by which American publics, or in some cases, European news readers, are determining the success of their imperial endeavor. And the reality is, it seems like the, the polls are stating that Iraqis don't love being occupied. And yet there's a continued obsession with looking for the positive outcome. Um, yes, Iraq is free as in free market, sure. Um, free as in um, your relatives are calling safely from their graves, free, yes. Like to be, to be um, free of being alive is certainly one way to interpret that. Um, free as in you can die for cholera if you fail to filter your own water. Yes. Um, free as in you can come home to Iraq if you want to, but your family might get kidnapped. Yes. Um, so the, the way that we articulate freedom as a guaranteed good is a failure to understand the way that it has been deployed as an instrument of war. And the anxiety over hope is consistently in the headlines. It's not a coincidence that editors choose that. It's partly because if you look at the material reality, there is no way to say that the US did anything good in Iraq. So you have to turn to these um, weird concepts like hope and freedom, which are, are essentially meaningless without any context, and then look around in the dark for a flat, with a flashlight for someone that says, you know, hey, it wasn't so bad. So I think there is a campaign for more redemption going on here that sidesteps a question about reparations and the material conditions that people are living in. Yeah, I could say a word about that as well. This, this notion of um, kind of US reportage about the uh, opinions of Iraqis as though the United States sort of like encountered the society. Um, and now there's some reporters who are interested in engaging, um, you know, Iraqi sentiment about, um, I don't know, the state of the country as though the US didn't play this massive role actually in impacting the society. And I wonder, Nabil, you know, you spoke to, um, you spoke to the question of sectarianism um, and ways that the US occupation promoted it and really um, uh, enshrined it in the government that the US cultivated. And I wonder if you could just say a bit more about how, um, not, o not only that, that history, but actually I'm curious about the state of sectarianism, sectarian division today in a place like Baghdad. Yeah. So uh, before the establishment of the Majlis al-Hukum or the Governing Council, which included 13 Shias, five Sunnis, five... Uh, one Christian, one Turkmen, and uh, five Kurds, uh, you know, obviously along ethnic and, and sectarian lines, and ironically putting the communists within the, with the Shias. Uh, there was in 92, the, a conference in, for the, for the opposition, opposition forces in, in Salah al-Din Resort, and, uh, and many opposition uh, parties were already planning to, uh, to divide the country along uh, or the rule of the country along uh, their perception of the uh, uh, comp what they call the components of the of the society, and then this will be 
again revisited and when they were when they used to meet in, in hotels in London with Zalmay Khalil Zad, another neoconservative who would later become ambassador. And uh, and then and it was imposed and enforced on on Iraqis by the uh, by the occupation and these these uh, opposition forces who who don't have uh, any support base and, and they are they were unknown to to millions of Iraqis would uh, would capitalize on the moment. And uh, again, not only, not only the, you spoke Kali about privatization, this was uh, the seeds were implanted when uh, the occupation authority gave rights to each of these parties to, to run, for example, to have economic power by running uh, the economic affairs of each of their ministries and the payrolls and, and all of that. And this of course would give us fiefdoms and, uh, and uh, patronage networks that would uh, just make uh, open the doors for uh, incredible corruption. But again, today we can see that, uh, it's not only muhasa sataifiya or sectarian, uh, let's say, segregation of or divisions, but of of the uh, political disorder. But there is uh, what I call a camaraderie in theft. Mm -hmm. You you can see. Uh, Sunni politicians, uh, you know, aligning with uh, with people who uh, perhaps would have fought against in ma many years uh, before. Of course, for the, to to uh, share the spoils of uh, of this abnormal situation that we have today, and this had made had made the situation in Iraq irreversible. Because how do you change that? Uh, and of course, we will revisit this with, when we when we speak about the revolution. But I want to say is that so much of this uh, sectarian rhetoric and the erasure of the Iraqi identity and the importation of Sunni, Shia, Kurd, this had nothing to do with the population, uh, with millions who are uh, victims to even Shias were victims to Shia armed groups and Sunnis were victims to Al Qaeda and the like. Uh, so they were complete detachment from, from from the from the masses. Even this rhetoric is. Is, was alien to, to, to the people who only knew that they are Iraqis until 2003. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I have a, a question for both of you, um, start with Kali, but it, it's about the what US involvement looks like today, because again, um, and unfortunately this is a feature of the war on terror in general, um, but when there are large troop deployments, there's some coverage. Um, uh, of what the US, US military operations look like. Um, but when those large scale operations are kind of wound down, um, there might still be military operations, but they're, they're just not talked about. Um, and similarly, there is a question of, um, uh, I imagine US, continued US and also other foreign corporate um, involvement in Iraq as well. So I just wonder if you could talk about, both of you could talk about um, what those ongoing relationships, you know, after the, the height of the occupation, um, but with the US and other foreign powers kind of looks like. Yeah, um, I have mixed feelings about how to answer this question in part because I think over the last few years of doing extensive interviews with families who have returned home from, from periods of displacement, there is an interesting dynamic between um, being abused by the U.S. and then being abandoned by the U.S. And to some degree, U.S. presence in Iraq is that of conducted chaos and that um, there aren't necessarily soldiers on bases in that sense. Um, but the kind of multiplicity and chaos of violence that people have experienced have people nostalgic for a time when it was clear who was trying to kill them and why. And I think that in periods of instability, um, I have heard people reflecting both an awareness that the US had triggered, caused, and continues to conduct the kinds of violence they experience, but also a nostalgia for a time when, um, when US presence might have put a cap on what they understand as chaos. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a very common phenomenon for people who are experiencing um, multiplicities of violence. There's also similarly um, comparison and nostalgia for former occupying forces. Mm -hmm. Um, 
whether that's comparing how much better the British were at occupying than the US or comparing um, different militias and different communities. And I work with many rural people who of course have seen different military installments come and go over periods of time and, and are to some degree experts on who did it better, um, who abused them less. And I've many a times heard people say, um, the person who's hurting me less is the ally that I'll choose, right? These are communities who would pick between, you know, who are having to choose between competing violators. So that's the subtle backdrop of answering the question, which is that um, at least among farming communities and, um, and people who are facing a lot of in infrastructural neglect in communities in Anbar province, that the US presence is legible as this policy legacy that has produced the kind of gutting of public resources. And so you might see um, American or, or European NGO workers who are coming and producing this NGOization, which is part of the privatization of public infrastructure. Um, or you might see like a UN vehicle driving through the city with like armored protection, which is frankly insulting. Um, or you might see that there's a U.S. company that is partnering with a Chinese company to build a private, you know, cell tower or something. And so there are all of these different entities who are coming in from all over the world and doing a lot of what we would call infrastructure repair that is private, right? It's for pay. And if you can afford it, it's great. And it's shiny and it's new and it works. And if you're you know, middle class or below, you have no access to it. You can simply envy it and the kind of protection that it receives from global regimes of power. I imagine that it's a bit different in Baghdad, but I don't do much work there. So perhaps Nabil, you could speak to that. Yeah. Let's put this here. <laughs> um, yeah, so so there are uh, troops in Al Assad and uh, Ain Al Assad Air Base in, in Al Anbar and uh, and in Erbil near the airport and uh, and again the what what we need to remember is uh, is that the U.S. presence on Iraq opens the door for employment for uh, for American millennials as, as Iraqis linger in uh, in unemployment and in limbo. Uh, you have not only students who would. Uh, uh, join the ranks of the army and then uh, have the empire paying their their uh, tuition but also you have uh, so many americans working in the uh, logistics and uh, there used to be kbr i'm not sure if kbr is still or vectros uh, uh, succeeded it but uh, these people provide food the laundry services and and so on and so forth and uh, of course uh, this was one of uh, one of the ways that these corporations would would ransack uh, billions of dollars. There are so much has been written at Halliburton and subsidiary uh, KBR and and of course the uh, privatization of the occupation with uh, with Blackwater would uh, invite thousands and thousands from all over the world to work and uh, to kill people, as happened in uh, Nusur Square. Uh, where 17 people, Iraqis, were murdered and then pardoned by by uh, Donald Trump. The point here is that it is a lucrative place for so many, but not for Iraqis. And the occupation also is uh, opens the door for a catastrophic economy to be cap uh, to capitalize on. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, this has been a pretty heavy conversation so far. Um, I want to start to shift to um, uh, questions of how Iraqis have been challenging this regime that has been cultivated and sort of instituted and imposed uh, by the U.S. and by its its um, Iraqi allies. Um, and I want to start, Nabil, with the uprisings of 2019, which were really incredible, I think very overlooked, um, you know, in the US. And if you could talk about them, about the breadth of them and about their objectives um, and what they achieved would be great. Uh, yeah, I, I don't tend to, I think it's better not to speak about revolutions and uprisings by looking at what they have achieved, but as ongoing processes, 
today, as we speak now, there are people protesting outside the parliament that are that is trying to reinstate an old elections law that uh, follows a, one electoral electoral district for a province, uh, and of course impedes the rise of uh, of independence uh, to the to the parliament. Uh, so yeah, 2019, uh, we were also hearing about progress and uh, not only by, by uh, international media, but also by Iraqi observers, many in DC and Atlantic Council and, and elsewhere. And uh, the government was signing contracts with China and, and all of these places. But in Iraq, I mean, uh, Walter Ambrose writes about uh, uh, the causes of uh, of the revolution in Egypt being inscribed on the urban fabric. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in Iraq. I mean, people before speaking about uh, let's speak about what they see. You know, there are amputated footbridges and disemboweled bridges still today, uh, and they do things in your head. And you look at mm -hmm. them, and you hate your existence, and you don't want to see concrete T walls every day. And they are not gone from from every street, as the international media tells you. These are the Again, giant, like concrete blast walls. Yes, yeah. yes. And then, uh, and then, uh, the, before in the in the in the build up to the to the uprising, there were the government was rounding up uh, street vendors and rounding up their their kiosks, and and there was uh, they were uh, of course uh, assaulting. Uh, holders of PhDs and master degrees on the street. So, and, and there were, again, this added up to, to, the many, to the many causes that were already in existence that people uh, would be uh, willing to, to reject and, and voice their uh, opinion against, against the government. So this was the most important thing I think that, I, that happened in my life is not only covering the, the protests, but also working uh excuse me a, a protesting myself people from all all backgrounds they were the affluent and the and the poor and uh i remember even people from kurdistan would come holding signs i come from Soleimania, which is incredible just just tells you that the system that has been disenfranchised the masses and and enforced uh, divisions amongst them just does not represent them in, in any way and of course, the uh, response by the by the reigning disorder was was lethal. They used not only uh, batons and uh, you know there were snipers shooting at people. There were this lethal tear gas canisters that lodge in people's heads and legs and and amputate and kill. And hundreds were killed and dozens of thousands were 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 injured. Of course, journalists were assassinated and uh, activists were were also assassinated or abducted and uh, almost with impunity. Uh, and the summer I worked uh, with Human Rights Watch on a, uh, on a report to sleep the law about, about these cases. And in, in so many ways, for example, Rihami Yaqub, Ramjad al-Dahamad, these are activists in the South. Uh, authorities would come and collect testimonies. And then what happens is that it, uh, it for, you know, it is condemned to the cellar of limbo. Again, no one knows what what are the what, what further procedures are. In many cases, the families would be would be threatened so as not to pursue uh, uh, justice. And again, there are so many of those who uh, who oversaw or failed to prevent the lethal uh, oppression are rehabilitated. For example, former Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi uh, and the militias. You know they. Now with the rise of the coordination framework government, they are more than ever empowered. You have uh, people who are uh, spokespersons for uh, for Haji Shabi, for for certain militias are now ministers. Mm. So uh, what is certain is, is that more protests are bound to happen. And uh, but it's difficult to say if this regime will ever be toppled because uh, there are strong militias with. with uh, you know, with their arsenals that are ready to to wage wars. I mean, just months before before this uh, last uh, government was passed, there were clashes in the, on the streets of Karadat Maryam in central Baghdad between the Sadrists and uh, and their uh, partners in the democratic process. And uh, it's just uh, 
incredible. Uh, but again, this this chaos and this abnormality is very lucrative to the to the rulers, and they are happy to sustain and maintain at any cost. Um, I have one more question for both of you before we open it to folks here and as well as folks watching online. Um, and that is, amid all of this, <laughs> I'm curious for for both of you what you see happening in Iraq, what you see Iraqis doing that is hopeful. Um, you know, perhaps about the present, but certainly for the future. Um, what do you see that's inspiring? I'll start with you, Kali. Um, yeah. Um, it's not about hope, it's about obstinance, but there's a lot of that. Um, so I'll just say one thing about T-walls briefly, which is that there are fewer of them because the regime has found this really clever clever way to embed them in the city in a way that looks less threatening, which is rather than having whole alleyways blocked off or whole footpaths or bridges blocked off, there's just one turn to the side and it's always ready to block things off. Mm. And so there's this um, threat of potentiality that has been written into the material environment that people are living in, producing this kind of um, like a subjunctive mode and uncertainty about what is to come and that uncertainty mm has done a lot of governing power that a gun could have also done. And um, what I found so striking, I, I recently brought a friend um, to Iraq and said like, look, here's Tahrir Square, here's the graffiti, this is where it all went down in the protests. And I, I was walking her towards the square and most of the time it's completely open, it's a traffic circle, everything's fine. And suddenly we walked up and realized that there were hundreds and hundreds of police suddenly had filled the square. And it wasn't a protest day and it seemed like maybe they were just, it was like a false alarm, but it was so clear that, um, that the regime was activated for any potential. Um, but the great thing about that was tremendous amount of security resources are wasted on the very potentiality that's being used against the people. Because this is of course a regime that's afraid of its own people. And so it's having to, you know, the, all of these thousands of guys with guns and uniforms flooded this square. And then an hour later it was empty. And so there is this sense, I think this is true all across Iraq, that anything could happen at any moment. Mm. And that's both incredibly paralyzing and incredibly mobilizing. Mm. Um, we should remember that one of the main slogans in, in during, the, during the protest was we want a homeland. Like we are mm. tired of our collective being gutted by the idea of, of sectarian division or by corporate extraction. And so it does seem to me that um, I saw enough evidence of state fear to say that um, if this current regime is not toppled, it will at least be outlasted. Hmm. And I think, um, yeah, so it's not about hope, um, which might be more revolutionary than obstinance, which is just continuing to survive anyway. Um, and, I, and I think this is probably the most true among farmers and mothers, because those are who I'm interacting with, whose job it is to produce the next generation. That's their mandate. And so they are going to make new lives happen on this land over and over again. And their project is to outlast the imperialism. And, and people say this all the time, right? That like, um, they'll either cite the Hadith that um, if it's the last day on earth and you're holding a date palm, plant it anyway. Um, or they'll say things like, um, you know, we've lasted through many different occupiers, will outlast yet another. So there is this sense that extends long past a single generation. And I, I suppose the question is what kind of transnational relationships are most conducive to that kind of stubborn obstinance going on in Iraq every day by people who are either organized in protest or doing what we would call disorganized everyday resistance, whether that's, you know, some of the farmers in, in Bazian Valley will like block the road to the factory on certain days because they just can't take the air pollution anymore. That counts too. Uh, so I think there is a, an important thing to mention here is that the current situation in Iraq is, be, is being normalized. In January, Iraq hosted the Arabian uh, Gulf Cup in, in Basra. And uh, this uh, fancy opening, of course, that ended in the final game with, the, with a stampede that uh, left so many supporters 
killed and then their deaths of course were uh, were forgotten now uh but this normalization is not only uh you don't only see it from foreign journalists for example one of them was uh, recently wandering around in one of the uh, restaurants uh, and and saying how beautiful uh everything is uh but also from from the state itself and uh and this obscured so many ongoing uh, catastrophes we have for example the northern town of sinjar where the Yazidis were massacred and enslaved. There are hundreds of thousands of IDPs still scattered on the periphery of life. Uh, a friend of mine who opened his eyes on the doom of war and who lives in a tent tells me on the phone that he cannot sleep at night because a thousand ghosts scream inside his head. Mm -hmm. So it's important not to forget these people. And also, uh, again, the United Nations is one of the organizations or one of the uh, bodies that are involved heavily in this normalization uh, and the last elections that were a response to the mass protests that would take place in that took place in 2019. Uh, they would uh, paint graffiti on these concrete tea walls and inviting people to to vote stop and take a selfie but they of course they it was lost on them that these are uh the same concrete blocks that don't don't only uh carry the scars from shrapnel or the funeral banners and stains of of, of blood but also the faces of the so many uh politicians you know uh, and and the militiamen who are involved in either killing people or failing to prevent their their death bill case willie in in uh, recently wrote in human rights watch how again foreign western diplomats were also invested in maintaining this stability in iraq so uh, iraqis are against all of these forces mm. and uh but that but there are so many things that would push them again and again to to voice their rejection of these systems that are manipulating their lives and uh making it uh, an unlivable wasteland to to say the least. Yeah. Um, okay, I want to give folks an opportunity here uh, to ask any questions or share thoughts. Um, do that. We also have at least um, one person has already written in online. So if you're folks who are watching online, if you want to submit questions, we can uh, get those too. But please. I'm curious um, what obstacles you or others have faced when you try to document or bear witness to the environmental toxicity and degradation. So from my understanding, I think in the past, when the World Health Organization has tried to study the health effects of depleted uranium, for example, the US has vetoed that kind of research. So just I'm kind of curious about that landscape and it was difficult for you or other people trying to do that. And then my second question maybe is naive and <laughs> overly trying to be hopeful, but I wonder what kind of um, like technical sort of um, efforts can be made to contain the environmental, um, like the health effects from environmental toxins, if any. Is it possible to show my very last slide? By chance. Um, I'll start with your second question, because the desire for a technical fix is a very American desire. I, I don't mean this to insult you at all, but there's not much you can do. You're not very useful. I'm not very useful. Um, and I say that because I've learned from these metals um, that the more you try to do stuff with them, the worse it gets. Right, because my understanding is that you're getting uranium that has been Yeah. So, and then that's the answer to the second question, which is a lot of focus is on depleted uranium. And, and the reason that is true is first of all, it's an unusual weapon. It was used in a particularly unusual way. Um, but from a chemotoxic perspective, it's probably not actually the most harmful chemical. What it does is it serves as a politically unique figure because it's isolated to the context of war. So if you learned that in fact it was lead that was poisoning Iraqi children most, then the American public would have to confront its own racism at home in order to address its imperialism in Iraq, which is why I showed you the supply chain I did. Because underneath 
The Islamophobia is the anti-Black racism that's going on that perpetuates the war on terror. And so it becomes a lot harder to have a technical fix and even a political fix if our unit of analysis expands from depleted uranium to the bomb itself. Um, depleted uranium can be replaced with another heavy metal. The only reason it's used is because it's heavy. And so um, we just need to be very careful when we're looking for solutions that the unit of analysis is imperialism as a structure rather than the objects that are used to perpetuate it. Because um, we all know that um, guns are dangerous, but cops are what kill people and they can use their knees to do it. So um, whether it's a machete or a nuclear bomb, it's the war part that's the problem. Um, that said, doctors are struggling to help, especially with reproduction and cancer. And some of the ways that they are mitigating these problems sound incredibly depressing, but might be the most immediate. One, stop conceiving children. Two, the most dangerous thing people can do is come home because their houses have been turned into burn pits too. And so ultimately the small fixes that people are using are to separate their bodies from the toxic exposures on the land and that means those air filters and those water filters and all the different kinds of barriers those prophylactic barriers that people use um, to protect themselves from their sources of life right to protect yourself from a river is a very strange um, disorientation but all of us do it now we have learned to protect ourselves from our food water and air and what that tells me here is that Iraqi environmentalists are incredibly active and many were involved in the protest to get the environment and environmental regulation back on the books and to make sure that it's enforced. But the other project is to just stop doing the thing we're doing, right? We have to stop. So like whatever laptop you're using, make that the last one because it's going to get burned somewhere and someone's going to breathe it, probably you. So stopping rather than doing is the answer to the question you asked, which is what do we do to fix this? No, I just have the mic in my hand. <laughs> One other response to just thinking about the question of what do you, once this contamination happens, because Kali and I are working on this, this research project, once this contamination happens, um, what do you do? <laughs> you know, it's out there. And um, like Kali said, there's no easy fix um, at all. Um, but we've started talking about learning about um learning from other places as well because iraq is not the first country to be contaminated by militarism and so there's an experience in the pacific islands for example um of nuclear testing and nuclear contamination um and which you know has a horrendous um uh history of um where again the us and other powers have sort of evaded their responsibility but there have been some instances in which like you know, through the political activity of Pacific Islanders, you know, they have isolated um, some of these, these, um, these toxic materials and just like put a concrete cap on it. Um, and which, you know, themselves, those caps are being neglected now. So, you know, this is sort of ongoing struggle, but we are wondering what happens if we put this conversation about Iraq in conversation with other places in the world. We've also um, here at IPS, we've, um, we have some relationships with folks from Laos, um, which has been um, in, in Vietnam, um, which uh, Laos in particular is called the most bombed country on earth um, because of the US war in Southeast Asia. But of course, Vietnam and Cambodia were also, you know, brutally um, uh, violated and contaminated. But that the work to decontaminate there is ongoing. And so what does it mean to add this to the conversation. Um, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to say one more thing. You asked about barriers to research. Um, the barrier to research is political will, as you mentioned, but the great thing about that is all these big institutions aren't doing it, which means it just takes me and a shovel, right? So this is a grid of all of the samples that I took with colleagues in Fallujah. And I think it's interesting that I found it important to show you the radioactive one because it was actually rare, but I knew it would capture an American audience's fascination with the nuclear. So that's just part of the way this conversation works. But like, you all can do soil and air testing, right? Part of citizen science is that actually we don't need a lot of um, high level political will 
to know about our environments. We can all do this stuff. Science is not as hard as it's been made to seem by regimes of knowledge production. Phyllis? Thank you all. This has been extraordinary and still is. I just wanted to add a point and another part of the question on the issue of the parallels with some of the other places around the world that have faced the impact of imperial wars, particularly around Laos and, and Vietnam. The question, yeah, so. the question in Vietnam, of course, was primarily around Agent Orange that destroyed huge amounts of land, left a huge toxic legacy of uh, birth defects, cancers, and it took decades, it took about almost four decades for US soldiers to win the right to get treatment for those, to, for them to acknowledge that Agent Orange was uh, responsible. There's been small scale efforts to get access to at least some level of funding for Vietnamese victims who of course are in the, in the millions and are now in the fourth generation, fifth generation now I suppose, uh, who have been facing this. In, and it's, there's been a small victory with a, a small amendment to a law that got a, some small amount of money as a start to go to Vietnam. There's been a, a larger victory around Laos where the, the, the bombing that Curie referenced uh, has been so severe and a recent victory to pay some millions of dollars to Laos for, for uh, dealing with unexploded ordnance. So one of the questions is, is there a parallel kind of campaign that you could envision that would engage, you know, it took 13 years here for the US soldiers uh, from Iraq to get the right to get treatment for burn pit uh, related cancers and other, uh, other diseases. And there's been nothing, as you know, for depleted uranium and for burn pit and other US caused uh, uh, pandemics across Iraq. So the question is, is there a campaign that you could envision that would link the work that some of the anti-war uh, soldiers organizations, Iraq Veterans Against the War, Veterans for Peace and others are looking at with campaigns led by physicians in Iraq or others who are trying to cohere information about the breadth of the, of the challenges faced now by the burn pits and, and still faced because of the depleted uranium. Is, there, is, that, is that something that you see as a feasible uh, campaign going forward as this occupation goes forward? Burn pits and depleted uranium are the least of Iraqi people's problems. Um, of the health and exposure surveys I did with over 200 families and a team of scholars, Almost everyone had witnessed a violent event at least once and had their home destroyed at least twice. Their property damage runs in the billions. I don't know how many times your house has been destroyed, but it costs a lot of money to build it back. So when we think about things like toxic exposure, um, I think we have to maintain the accompanying kinetic violence that people face. Um, yes, of course, there could be a campaign in which military experience with toxicity finds its analogous partner in Iraq. American soldiers are experiencing harm from burn pits. Therefore, those Iraqis who also did should, yes, also be compensated. But that still centers the American model of where the harm should be centered. And the reality is when you destroy someone's economic underpinnings, often they prioritize that first. I know hundreds of farmers in the United States who are worried about cancer, but they're more worried about the crop yield. So we have to remember um, how people are prioritizing their concerns. And, um, and that is not to in any way paralyze those campaigns. It's just to make sure that we center the priorities that those who have suffered the most loss are listing as their priorities. Um, in some ways that makes it easier because property damage is incredibly easy to calculate. And frankly, it doesn't take that much time. I mean, I did it by accident, just talking to people about exposures. Um, how much money is one entitled to for um, 
permanent disability due to chemical exposure? I don't know, but I bet it's somewhere in a workers' comp booklet somewhere. So yes, definitely, people in the United States should be finding ways to attach their campaigns to Iraqi-led reparations requests. Absolutely. Other questions from folks here? If not, I know there was a question submitted online on Facebook or Phyllis, is that true? Oh, it's a question you asked. Yeah, okay. Okay, I see a question back here, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, just because some folks here came from a youth organizing around anti-militarism and a lot of, you know, the, the war on terror started before some of those folks were even born. And I think like the legacy of these wars, especially with the media telling us that these wars have ended, how have you seen and obviously we know that's not the case. So you're talking about your research that you've done in Iraq, but what can and should we be doing in our organizing spaces around these issues to compare them? Like your research around economic or um, environmental racism in the South and showing those, um, you know, very analytical and statistic based um, connections of the toxic waste sites. But how do we make this more palpable and real for communities who are, who are suffering in different ways um, to really like change the narrative around the war on terror? Uh, I think so much can be done here. It's first by talking about Iraq and other places in the global south that were uh, that this country wrecked havoc on. For example, I come from uh, I study at Georgetown University, and uh, this is a place where people like Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, come to our armed reception, and and uh, students chase them around the campus and uh, filming them, and uh, flags are lowered for. Colin Powell and, and, and these people when they when they pass away. I think by merely speaking about uh, what happens at the receiving end of America's foreign policy and not letting uh, crimes slip into the realm of, uh, of amnesia, of collective amnesia. It's, uh, that in itself is an important act that should be, that should be done collectively by so many, uh, especially young uh, people in this country. I'll say one activist-y thing. Um, I think we all know that a very common American sentiment, um, even among those who are often oppressed by these regimes, is that more weapons make us safer. That's sort of like an interesting fallacy. Um, and I think what many of you have been doing on your campuses and in popular discourse is to bring the concept of militarism back into the discussion as a problem. Um, I, I don't think people are using the word militarism in a critical way at all. And so how can you even start the conversation like, I think we owe Iraqis an apology, or I think we owe Iraq reparations, or I don't want my river polluted by undetonated munitions from a military training camp without identifying militarism as the thing that it is. So I think that discursive move is really critical. Um, but then the second thing is, at least through the chemotoxic frame, which is obviously a simple flawed frame in a lot of ways, it refutes the idea that more weapons make us safer, mm -hmm. right? So we have communities who are actively serving in the military who might actively even believe in that, who are getting sick. So we know that more weapons don't make us safer, they give us cancer. And us is like the big kind of royal one that's usually a problem. So I think that's, you were talking about the, the discourse around it. Um, I think a great example in the United States right now is the Cop City protests, right? Which 
are about environmental destruction. People want to level a forest. It's also about the kind of racism that it imbues. But it also, given that people were threatened or accused of being terrorists, speaks to the way the war on terror gets boomeranged back into civilian discourse and the same kind of regimes. I mean, that is where the war on terror is happening right now. And so the goal is to shut down these sites or prevent them from existing in the first place. And you maybe can speak to the burn pit protests that are happening um, in Guam right now, maybe? Me? Yeah. Just that there's there's prevent there are prevention actions that are helpful. Yeah, just that it exists. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, there is, you know, I mentioned before that we're um we're we're engaging not only with um histories of how people in Pacific Islands have dealt with toxic contamination, but, um, you know, Kali spoke to like, let's stop this from happening right now. Let's prevent this from happening in the future. And so in a place like Guam, which is um, a U.S. territory, a third of which uh, belongs to the Department of Defense in the form of military bases, like a third of their island, there are these efforts to, um, to stop the um, construction of uh, more bases, which is really the destruction of their, their, um, their, uh, their environment and their home, which disrupts the whole process of militarization because, um, you know, the, the nuclear submarines that were just um, approved uh, to be sold to Australia, those are going to dock in Guam, you know, that, that's, that's the plan. Um, and so, you know, there are these, these there's, there are people and activists, uh, activists in Guam who are contesting both the past contamination and trying to prevent militarization, militarization in the future um, that we want to be in conversation with. Um, I'm going to um, momentarily give you both um, opportunities to kind of give last thoughts where the sun is setting, um, a number of us are fasting and it's time to break our fasts. Um, uh, and this has been a really rich event. Um, uh, I do just, just um, before uh, I, I turn it back to you, I'm thinking about what you both just said um, and uh, inspired by the group of folks who just came in um, from the centers uh, who were just at a protest action, um, uh, doing that work of contesting militarism here, um, which you know, not only tells the truth about people like Colin Powell and all these others who uh, bear such responsibility um, for you know, these, these horrendous violations, but even to have a conversation on our campuses, um, in our communities about militarism, it opens the door for more of an engagement with what's happening in Iraq now. I mean, I, th I think it, it, it helps cut against the fact that um, there is so little conversation in the mainstream, you know, US about Iraq at all. If we can actually put militarism back on the table, then it opens that, that channel potentially. Um, okay, I saw a hand here. Yeah, not at all. Just, but I I did see in the news recently that there were uh, the United States is still they were kind of rejecting an attempt from another country to I think like um, open a case against some leader. Sorry, I'm like totally butchering this, but somewhere else in the world, and the rationale was essentially if there is room for like the ICC, the International Criminal Court to, uh, for another kind of Western nation to be held accountable, that means that the United States potentially could, and that's just not gonna happen. So there's no, you know, there's no, essentially we can't allow these mechanisms to have an opening to hold the United States accountable. So with that being said, um, you know, what are, what are the potentials for, for accountability, for reparations? Obviously we can start grassroots, um, but what other mechanisms exist if international law is essentially untouchable, at least as it exists right now? Um, and to that end, um, Nabil, I would love to hear from you around like the ethics of um, of using images of war in order to, as uh, Curry was just saying, kind of reinsert this narrative into the table. Um, because I agree wholeheartedly, especially as, as people that are coming of age as we're being told that these wars are ending. Um, it's really hard to convince people of the kind of slow violence that's happening at the pace that it's happening. So even if we, you know, we don't really have a case anymore to say that actively, well, that's not true. We do have many examples of people actively being, you know, having their homelands destroyed. But when you're talking about slow violence, that's hard to track and it's hard to really hit with impact. I'm curious about, you know, the role of image, of narrative, like what, 
what mechanisms can we use grassroots and then what mechanisms just are like not going to be able to be used um, in the larger scale. Thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll give it to both of you to respond to those and also um, give your kind of closing thoughts. Yeah. Uh... I think accountability is a far-fetched dream for, for so many Iraqis. You have, I mentioned earlier how the Blackwater uh, mercenaries who murdered 17 Iraqis uh, were acquitted under uh, uh, Donald Trump. You have, uh, there was a recently uh, a piece in Al Jazeera English about a survivor of Abu Ghraib, uh, of the bowels of Abu Ghraib and the torture of, Amer of US uh, you know, it's not only the mercenaries, but also those in the in uniform as well who torture and kill and maim. And uh, their pursuit for uh, accountability has been an arduous process and uh, without finding open doors. And this, uh, you know, Western world that loves liberties and uh, human rights, uh, what can be done? I am obviously, you know, I don't have the 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 answer, but uh, what is what we can do is that keep asking questions, not only about in, in Iraq, but also, for example, what Julian Assange is is facing, and you know, being uh, kept in Belmarsh to to die slowly, as uh, you know, the United States, uh, you know, just wants to to silence another another nuisance, and uh, and yeah, it's important to to just continue to speak about it and uh, about imagery. Uh, you know, there, there is so much that can be said about uh, about it, especially in our in our time. You know, with the use of smartphones and and all of that, uh, and how to avoid, you know, being uh, acting in a predatory way, as uh, Susan Sontag says in, in in her book on on photography. But there are things, there are instances instances where, for example, a certain act, a, a certain incidents happen, and you bring the and you bring the photo, this is what photojournalism is to raise awareness to, 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 to you know, to bring the evidence. But again, uh, it is important not to, as Regine Sahagian writes in an art forum about torture and the Berlin Biniali, you know, you have this French artist who enlarged the images of tortured civilians to, to gigantic uh, proportions. Uh, and again, it, you know, it doesn't serve the you know of course without their consent without the consent of those people who are who are tortured so all of you know small thoughts and a long answer that didn't answer your question um i'm just jotting down a few of my key takeaways from our discussion um one is that it's very clear both in iraq and the united states that electoral politics and the jurid juridical system are not vectors for justice they that is not how political change seems to be made. Uh, it doesn't mean that there can't be pressure there, but that's that's not it. That's not the answer. Um, it's okay to hold individuals and institutions accountable for things that happened a long, long time ago, even before you were born. Hmm. Um, I. On the one hand, I don't want us to do this retrospective version where we only talk about the last 20 years instead of the last 50, or we don't talk about the next 20 years and the next 50. And on the other hand, I think part of um, preparing for a dissident future is doing the memory work of, um, of holding accountable those institutions and people that built the institutions and worlds that we were born into. Um, I had to learn about Vietnam to understand the mechanisms that are available for justice in Iraq, for example. Um, so collective memory is a huge part of the way that epistemic violence can be confronted or perpetuated, um, which is just to say telling the story and doing the thing is part of getting the record right. Um, and then two other things I have learned over the course of intimate field work, especially talking about people's reproductive lives, which is that censorship was and is a key part of the war on terror. Uh, when those pictures came out of people being tortured, um, it was the least of violence that was done to people's bodies. People were being dismembered right and left in bombing campaigns and, and people's homes were being busted into. And all of that was hidden, right? The US had a policy of not showing violence. And 
Uh, exposure is definitely a risk, but censorship is a guarantee. And it's a kind of violence that I think Iraqi people have faced for a long time and uniquely so. Um, and then the last thing is that empire has this really excellent way of redistributing moral burdens from the state to corporations and people, which means our complicities also have to be acknowledged in more intimate ways than we might be comfortable with because we don't want to take a neoliberal approach where we are suddenly like buying the air, the moral air filters and not holding our governments accountable for how they distribute resource. But on the other hand, our points of intervention um, may not be the focal points that we are most comfortable with because we are more complicit with our corporations. Um, often we are colluding with them as employees and beneficiaries than we might be with our government. And I think that when we follow the chain of supply that I was showing you, um, your relationship to a coal tan mine is a lot more intimate maybe than your relationship to, um, you know, Governor X. So um, we can't do the thing that I think the United States is doing a lot right now, which is relying on the injury alibi to avoid our own personal responsibilities, right? That just because we are harmed by the American empire, just because, you know, our families were displaced or enslaved or brutalized, um, doesn't mean we aren't also complicit and holding both of those truths at once is really painful, but also really important when we're building alliances, uh, especially those transnational alliances that mean that our Americanness often trumps everything else about us to the rest of the world. And owning Americanness is really hard to do when it's the thing that brutalized your own family for generations, but here we are. And that's, that's something that I think is worth contending with publicly and talking a lot about as we think through what accountability is supposed to look like. Well, I wanna thank you both and thank you all for joining us um, because the not only um, is what's happening in Iraq and what has happened and what will happen important in its own right, but those of us who live here in the United States, our entanglements are many um, and uh, they have to be interrogated. And the question of what our responsibilities are um, to justice here, to justice in Iraq and our responsibilities in those relationships, I think that those aren't easy questions to answer, but we have to ask them. That is, that is our charge. Um, we can't accept the limited conversation that we've had this week that looks at Iraq and what happened there as a retrospective and say that the story is over. Um, but we have to, I think, ask where we are in that story and what our roles are today. So deep gratitude. Um, I wanna give another shout out to the organization Dissenters um, and folks who are watching on the Dissenters live stream. If you're a young person who's interested in confronting militarism and organizing against it, check out Dissenters and uh, wherever you are, figure out how we can organize and continue this conversation in this work. So thank you and please uh, join me in giving a round of applause to our speakers. Now we have some food and water in the back. <laughs>